Here we go. I started recording. Uh, by the way, welcome everybody to this new meeting. Today we're going to have a speech as largely anticipated on LinkedIn and all the media. To have our friend Bob Havestein from the Netherlands. So we'll love not to waste too much time into introduction. Bob has already gone through one meeting last year, exactly in April, by the way. So it's my pleasure to introduce him again and let him speak about sustainability and supply chain. So Bob, I'll leave it on to you right away to start your, your discussion, your introduction. Please take the stage, stage is yours. You can start. Thank you. Uh... I don't know, what do you see now? I don't think you see my right screen. Do you see my screen? Yes. Yep, perfectly. With a, with a slide also, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. So, uh, yeah, we live actually in strange time. Um, if you think about it, we just uh, know how to deal with an international health crisis, COVID-19. And now suddenly it's replaced by this russia ukraine crisis. And on top of that, uh, we already have to deal with all kinds of extreme weather conditions, climate change, inequality, just to name a few. So how do you explain the impact of your organization, not only on the economy, but also on the environment and on people? How do you inform what you do is actually good? Well, you can do that with all kinds of communication. You can just put, publish a, a number of posts out there in the open, uh, social media, for instance. What you would like to have is a, a solid solution, which is really um, comparable and five verifiable. Well, and if you think about those two words, you probably already have a solution in, in mind because you're dealing with that uh, on a frequent basis. But um, what you would like to do is to be more transparent really uh, about what you do for the environment, the social and the governance type of impacts. Currently, you have all kinds of reporting in that related to the ESG. That's on an annual basis, but you would like to move that into the future to we really see this on a, yeah, a, a daily basis and maybe real time even. So you would like to show the world that you and your actions are really sincere and that you practice what you preach. Uh, and that's all what sustainability is about. Um, so what we'll discuss today is briefly is the ESG fundamentals, basically stating what is sustainability given the definition some small uh, insight on some of the reporting possibilities there, a little bit more on focusing on the European Union and what is happening there related to sustainable finance and in a particular the taxonomy. Uh, then the combination of supply chains and sustainability, and also touch a little bit upon with, we have to deal with uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, even the smaller ones as well, uh, and what they can play for a role. But I think the most important part is actually what I really ask you to pay attention to. Act now, because we really have to become climate fit. Uh, trade and supply chain finance you can use really as an incentive to make the change uh, possible. And you can use yourself shift to a future-proof business. That's not only from a corporate perspective, but also from a banking perspective, basically. So if you think about it currently, sustainability is really a container concept. Um, if you look out uh, in all kinds of articles, you see that we're sustainable, uh, we have a sustainable product, our product is green. But what do they really mean with it? Because there's so much terminology around it, it's extremely vague. It also provides really all kinds of means of the typical word of greenwashing. So we'd like to avoid this. So then it's good to give some kind of definition to sustainability. And in this case, you can use the pillars of the ESG, three pillars to describe basically sustainability. So you describe it in environmental sustainability, social sustainability, and governance sustainability. So some examples of environmental sustainability, you think about then energy efficiencies, the carbon footprint, the biodiversity, but also the amount of water you actually use in your operations. As an example of the social sustainability is that you think about labor standards, wages, human rights, supply chain management and the effect of that on the whole supply chain. And governance then is more about what is the composition of the board? Think about how many women, for instance, are represented there, as well as the compensation, how much do you pay them? And if you're involved with bribery and corruption. So these are kind of means to 
to define what is sustainability. But on the other hand, why are so and so interested in this sustainability thing? Well, one of the things, of course, you hear a lot in the, in the news, uh, and as a company, you're more and more forced to actually report on it. And when I hear also in the news is that we refer to the uh, a lot of uh, extreme weather conditions which are experiencing, as well as information from the uh, IPCC, all kinds of reporting that we actually are having to face what we are dealing is doing wrong and we have to act. Uh, for me, it started um, more than 25 years ago. As a student, I started to be involved with research on nuclear fusion, which is basically trying to recreate the sun here on Earth by putting two, melting two particles together. And with that, it releases energy. So it actually could be an energy source, which is controllable and can replace gas, oil, uh, and coal, and actually be a new energy source to the mix of solar, wind, and uh, water energy. Um, I heard at that time also many uh, uh, discussions and some nice presentations where climate change and the problems related to it became very clear to me. So I thought like this is really interesting research I want to be involved with. But unfortunately, the broader public, didn't know, broader public didn't know it. And then around 2006, you had the inconvenient truth from Al Gore. And we saw this extremely nice documentary. Uh, it got a number of prizes. And um, yeah, people started to act a little bit on it. But really, the urge, the necess necessity to really change became not really clear yet. Um, at the moment, you can actually see a really nice documentary on Netflix from uh, David Attenberg. Uh, called uh, the breaking boundaries that's describing how he and witnessed in his lifetime the changes of the world and basically describing that we are breaking or extending the boundaries of our earth basically to destroying our own home our planet earth so people are more and more aware of it and as well as because of all the uh, publications out there in the media but if you think about it actually most of the real starts as a community from a political point of view also, and countries uh, that have started being involved and interested in this is really in 2015 with the Paris Agreement. In the Paris Agreement, they decided that we actually should not exceed two degrees Celsius rise of temperature. And actually we would like to keep it at 1.5 degrees compared to pre-industrial area. Um, then in 2019, we had a European Green Deal where we described that we would actually have a 55% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions in 2030. And another good example that where we discussed is in Europe, we would like to be the first climate neutral continent in 2050. Well, on top of that, um, 2021, we also had the Glasgow statements where we really wanted to achieve net zero and this one and a half degrees, so not even the two degrees, but we're limiting, it to, uh, limiting ourselves to the 1.5 degrees. Protect ecosystems and habitats, mobilize all kinds of planets, because if you want to achieve this, you need a really huge amount of investment, not only from the financial institutions, but also from the private industry and investors combined, and more, more collaboration. Basically, you cannot depend and think that the rich countries can do all this on their own and the poor countries can do that on their own. No, I think the, the rich countries should really help the poorer countries to achieve this and how to deal, for instance, with the rising sea levels. So there became some kind of standards and uh, discussions on how we can actually limit this. Uh, but we also heard that uh, actually yesterday with a new report of the IPCC, we really have to act now because uh, we have discussed a lot. There are some nice initiatives, but they won't be sufficient to achieve the goals we actually would like to achieve. And how became that possible to actually make that statement? Well, with that, we actually require some kind of reporting. And you want to actually report that you make impact. What is your effect on the economy, the environment, and the people? So in that case, you want to be very clear about what you mean, how you uh, put your reputation forward, how that it means for your client, for your employees, what it does for your customers, and also the community operating. So for that, you can use reporting, but then you come to another problem. Um, and that is basically what is a good report. And then you have two things, you have standards and frameworks. Uh, and that already gives itself uh, another discussion, uh, which needs to be cleared up. I mean, uh, 
try to do that. So a standard is more something you agree on, a quality requirements that we think is acceptable and we can use it for reporting. So, and also the reporting entity accept this. Uh, a few examples which are out there in the market related to uh, sustainability reporting uh, are these uh, which are presented. Uh, you see a lot of nice symbols with uh, acronyms. Uh, for instance, the Global Reporting Initiative, the GRI, or the EFRAG, the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group. All kinds of nice innovations. I don't know by heart, that's why I have to look them up also. So next to standards, you also have then frameworks. That's basically guiding principles helping you to shape your thoughts. And how do you think about a certain topic? But there's no really reporting obligation related to it. So there's a difference between the standards. But it already gives you and helps you to give aid, to give insight. So in some examples on that, uh, you see here, for instance, the TCFD, the European Financial Reporting, uh, uh, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, or the CDP, which is the carbon disclosure project. And in the middle, actually, you see one probably all recognize that's the United Nations Sustainable, Sustainability uh, Development Goals. So, yeah, this helps you more or less as a company or as a financial institution to use something to be able to report on. And a lot of that information is also being reused by other uh, agencies, ranking agencies, which also give you a lot of information. So they basically use all kinds of information, but basically is used or reported on by public and listed companies. Um, unfortunately, if you start comparing with them, they have quite a huge deviation between each other. Um, if you look at the ratings uh, for credit from these companies, there is basically um, an overlap, a correlation, a relationship between them of about 99%. So you can, doesn't matter which one you take, you basically get the same results. But if you start looking at ESG rating, then the correlation is slightly above 50%. So it really depends which one you take. And therefore it's a little bit of a trick to use these numbers. So you really have to go into discussion with them because they're kind of black boxes. You have to understand how they use the initial data and how they come to their final result. But this could be very useful to be able to show and use for all kinds of reporting for yourself or for your company. So these are ways to actually give this transparency, either by reporting or you use ratings from rating agencies. Um, in the European Union, we also have something which is called the European Sustainable Finance Strategy. This is basically a strategy which helps to put more finance into sustainability and make this transition possible so we actually are achieving the goals which are presented, for instance, in the European Green Deal. Um, and there, we would like to have all kinds of regulations which basically promote sustainable investments. You manage your finance to risk much better and also make the shift from short-term thinking to long-term thinking. And there are a huge amount of regulation possible there. And they all have the means to provide transparency. So you see here a huge amount of words, but I would like to focus later on, on only one of them, and it's EU taxonomy. Well, these regulations, as I mentioned, really give transparency because they give or use the same criteria about to describe what is a sustainable product. They provide greater transparency on the sustainability risks. They provide you this framework for all kinds of objectives, and they promote cooperation because collaboration is important. We cannot do this on your own. Sounds also familiar if you're very uh, much involved in trade and supply chains. So the EU taxonomy is basically the building block of many of the regulations in the European Union. It gives you an assessment of sustainability. It's basically a classification system with criteria to describe which activities you perform as a company can actually be defined as being sustainable. And they have to be then contributing substantially to uh, a few environmental objectives. Um, they do, should not have harm the other objectives which actually are defined, and they also should meet minimum safeguards. In this moment, it's only focusing on environmental. Uh, in the later stage, it will also include the social and the governance aspects of sustainability as well. So the taxonomy in itself already gives a company a tool, a tool 
to show and to make actually an assessment on sustainability themselves and show their impact, not only in the environment, on the social and governance, so basically on the economy, the environment and on people. So that I can help you to manage your reputation, to manage your risks. Um, maybe as a company, you already have to uh, report on this, so you also are compliant. And the number of companies which have to report on this is also growing over time. Currently, it's only related to uh, public and listed companies, but in the long run, uh, even small and medium-sized enterprises should be reporting on this. And also, as financial institutions should also have a look at this and report on this, how green they are in their whole uh, uh, ratio related to the amount of loans and finance they give, how green they are. They also will uh, start thinking about, do I want you and your client and your finance actually be part of my banking book itself. So how easy it is actually to get access to finance becomes also very important. So in that perspective, you also make your future proof your own business. So the more green you are, the more likely it is you will have access to finance and be able to run your business in the future as well and do all kinds of investments to even become better. So therefore the taxonomy is just a small building block but extremely important. And it is not related only to the European Union, but it will have effects also on your whole supply chain, and therefore on a global basis. So sustainability and supply chains are quite intertwined with each other, in my opinion. And I think they can provide also a solution to these three challenges. Because if you think a little bit more about the E and S energy, the environmental, social, and governance, you can also relate them together again with this, uh, the sustainable development goals from the United Nations. For instance, environmental, then you come to decent work, industry innovation, sustainable uh, cities and communities, and partnerships and goals. If you think about governance, then you also have uh, the effect on it on clean water, responsible consumption, uh, life below water, life on land, uh, climate action, and social. Then we talk really about no poverty, zero hunger, good health, gender equality, peace and justice. And if you think about it, if you would provide enough money to your supply chain participants, and they're able to provide a living wage, they actually have a huge impact already because we're providing a living wage to all your participants in the supply chain. You make it possible that there is no poverty, you avoid hunger, so there's zero hunger, you have good health and health being, you provide the chance for good quality education, gender equality, uh, you reduce the inequalities in that perspective as well, uh, you provide the chances of clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, uh, decent work and economic growth, uh, industry innovation and infrastructure. Um, and I think that actually you touch most upon them, which are already present in this overview of the uh, development goals from the United Nations. So this little aspect has already a huge impact on your supply chain. And if you think about it as a company, um, you also have maybe different value drivers. Why you want to do things, why you want to invest in digitization or data management. Um, uh, to name a few, data management, ownership, process automation, you would like to have more transparency, uh, you would to be, want to be compliant, uh, you want to improve your data sharing. And as I was mentioned, basically a year ago, Andrea mentioned in the presentation I gave at that time, I also showed that blockchain can already help you in that perspective uh, to build trust, to announce the transparency, reduce costs, um, make it more possible to collaborate, support paperless trade. And also in this case, you can actually support sustainability because it's just a side effect of all the other value drivers you have. If you want to have more transparency in your whole supply chain, with that, you get basically also more insight on the effect you have as a company and your whole supply chain on the environmental, social, and governance parts. Because if you look a little bit more about the supply chain, 
it starts with raw material sourcing. Uh, you would like to show that if you produce t-shirts, that it's organic cotton, uh, no child labor has been involved. So the end user is kind of very happy with that, that you manufacture or something, but you also want to show that you're not polluting uh, the ground where the factories are and where you're actually distributing it, that you're not using very much dirty exhaust uh, of trucks, for example. But this is only looking upstream again. If you think about supply chain and sustainability, you have to look at the whole chain. So you also have to look downstream, the usage of it and the end usage of it. And actually, this is still a very linear process. And um, one of the goals is also in 2050 to be a climate zero you know, as you, uh, the first continent uh, in the European Union. Then you have to think of a completely different business model. So then you would like to be more circular. So you basically start reusing a lot of your materials and there's very little waste. So you also require very little new materials as sourcing. But at this moment, um, about 80% of all the carbon emissions are part of, of course, by global supply chains because nothing is happening in the near vicinity. A lot of production from the richer countries are happening actually in the poorer countries. So you cannot state like, okay, you have to solve it. We have to do this together. So you have to look at all kinds of possibilities of how to deal with that. An example is really that you can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, the amount of emissions you have from CO2, for instance. And that is being measured also in three different uh, scopes, as they call it. The first one is a direct emission, which is basically uh, caused by the operation of the company. The second one is indirect, and it's being caused by the energy or electricity you use for your operations. And the third one is the indirect emissions. It's basically all the emissions from your value chain. So that also includes your suppliers, your distribution, logistics, your business travel. So a, a lot of things related to that can become then whole part of the whole supply chain. So it's not only you as a company, you have to see the whole supply chain. So even for just measuring the greenhouse gas emissions and specifically for scope free emissions, you have to understand the whole supply chain. But there the transparency plays a part again. And as you know, blockchain can provide this help to increase the collaboration and transparency. But what can you do, for instance, if you just think about the decarbonization possibilities in your supply chain? Well, it starts all, of course, with raw materials. So you can source green or use much more of the recycled products and materials already. So you, instead of really being linear, you already try to be more of a you know, uh, business model. Uh, if you do your manufacturing, you want to improve the energy efficiency of the processes. Uh, you want to use other energy sources. So instead of using energy from coal, gas, or oil, you maybe use already uh, energy from your solar panels, which you have on your business. Or you use hydrogen, uh, which becomes available. And at the same time, you want to use more and more recycled components. Well, if you do the distribution, of course, it's very obvious that you can think about an electric fleet. Um, also here, you have to think more about your energy and your operational efficiency. And uh, yeah, the renewable energy in part of your operations in general can also play a huge role and affect already. And to your users of your product, yeah, you can promote there to be more sustainable and the sustainable usage of it. And if you then think about if they want to deposit this impose of it that you promote actually to the user that they use it longer maybe you can reuse it and otherwise use second plant reselling of course it all depends on the type of products you're involved with the services or it becomes much more difficult so this is a, a supply chain the effect of sustainability and just a few measures which are already helpful by decarbonization of your supply chain but we also know in global supply chains, uh, about 80% of them are seaborne. So we have to also do, be able and deal with shipping. And if you then think about it, if you are involved with shipping, you also have to enter the port. 
And if you're part of a port, you're part of a complete and difficult ecosystem where many parties are involved in. And even here in this part, um, you would like to make this much more efficient. Not only but collaboration between these parties, where again, blockchain can provide fantastic means to share information on a need to know basis and give insights and transparency when it's required. Uh, there is more involved in it and you can use all kinds of nice technology on that because if you think about it a port is nothing else than a funnel for info for goods which are coming in and leaving either from the seaside or from the hinter hinterland side more inside uh, so yeah which way you go you can see it as a bit of a funnel where a lot of things are happening before the goods are uh, distributed again so here you can think about all kinds of initiatives uh, where you can uh, optimize the flow through this whole port ecosystem by um, announcing more, much more in advance when a ship is coming, the efficiency inside the port can be actually also much better. When you know a ship is coming, you know exactly where the goods are on the ship as well. When you unload it, you know exactly when it is being unloaded. So the person, who, uh, the company which has to pick it up can already be notified in advance when you expect it to be available. Um, when it's already available and a lot of the information already has been shared in advance, customers can already decide if they want to clear it, yes or no, or they want to inspect the container in advance for the goods. Uh, a lot of the paperwork, therefore, can already be done in advance. So instead of being an extremely linear process, which currently is the case, with the help of digitization, you can already speed up things and make it a little bit more parallel. So the port in itself, you can think of a system which benefits a lot from um, a digital twin. We can follow the goods on, on an electrical way. Uh, you know exactly where the ship is coming in by all kinds of um, measurements. You know exactly how the, the water is moving. So you know exactly when a ship can be actually docking on uh, the releasing the goods, when they can be picked up, when they can get food claims from customs, be picked up at the end and actually leave to the next modality out in the hinterland. So you can, with the help of all kinds of digitization poss possibilities, where blockchain can provide a huge role, you can actually optimize this uh, movement of goods through the port. And with that, of course, that has a huge impact on environmental, social, and governance perspective. Because if you think about digitization, you'll have a huge impact on education, decent work and economic growth, industry, innovation, and infrastructure, sustainable cities and communities, as well as partnerships, because you cannot do this on your own. So it's all about data collaboration between all the stakeholders. You can improve the, the, the flow of information, either it's digital or still on paper, but at least you would like to uh, improve the documentation flow. And as I mentioned, with the help of port call optimizations and just in time arrival of good ships and all the communication inside this ecosystem, you can improve a lot of the communication and also the speed of which goods are arriving in the port as well as leaving in the port in the next modality. If you think about health, safety, and security, you, yeah, you have, that is just following the latest procedures. And think about safety. Um, think about how your personnel, and your visitors, actually are uh, have to fill with requirements when they're actually on the port society. That you, of course, have all kinds of security in place, um, but also that is still an accessible uh, area and not just completely closed and difficult to access and uh, enter and leave as well as you can optimize all kinds of inspections of cargo as well as the passengers itself and what becomes more and more important is also cyber security because uh, the more uh, we are depending on the utilization we also have to be aware that we have to be secure and in control of all the data and not all the data becomes you know, readily available to everybody You can also think really about the environment. Um, when a ship comes in, 
instead of using its engine when it's lying at the cave, you can provide all kinds of means of cleaner energy, uh, help them not to pollute the water inside the harbor as well, but make sure that there's fresh uh, water available when you bunker, that you also think um, that they are not just from uh, their litter overboard, but you have a collection and so you can reuse and recycle uh, a lot of the materials they actually not used on the ship anymore, but could be used for other processes. And therefore you protect the habitat, the biodiversity in the clear surroundings of the port. And climate and energy is also quite uh, obvious in this perspective. We would like to use more um, uh, efficiency of the energy use, think more about a circular uh, economy, um, think about re using more and more renewable energy. As you mentioned previously, also as examples, you can reduce the carbon footprint uh, a lot, footprint a lot. Um, think about clean ships, alternative transport fuels. So they're also actually uh, polluting less. So all kinds of initiatives you can actually do, make visible and transparent. So you have a huge impact on sustainability and therefore your whole supply chain by also picking what is the right port, not only from a perspective, what is the best way to get it as quickly to my client or my customer, but also what is the best impact if I use this in this port, because it has a better impact on the environment or from a social or governance perspective, because that becomes also very important. So next in coming, uh, climate fit, uh, you have to understand that SMEs play a huge and important role because about 90% of all the businesses over the whole world are actually small, medium sized enterprises and they provide about half of all of the employment. And these companies are also very difficult to, to really know where to start because they lack access to knowledge, access to finance, they don't have the right incentives. Uh, because they are only want to produce, 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 or deliver, 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 because you ask for it. And they cannot make then a huge investment. So we really need to help these uh, small, medium-sized enterprises with help of knowledge, of course, but also if you would like to improve the efficiency or the scores related to sustainability in your supply chain, you give, have to give them incentives. And one of the best ones is actually to provide them is access to finance, give them incentives to actually improve their services because in the end you benefit from it. So here trade finance as well as supply chain finance instruments can play a huge role. You can give them discounts by delivering quicker, for instance. So supply chain finance actually helps because you would like to have sustainable operations. In the end, that creates financial benefits. So it supports a sustainable strategy, which in turn helps with the supply chain management. So in the end, you have better operations and financial benefits. So you really feed the wheel in order to make this huge impression, uh, possibilities and improvements in your whole supply chain and give the right incentives uh, to all the players in the supply chain. So what I hope uh, I've shown you and what we discussed is give you a little bit of uh, some of the fundamentals of ESG, some of the standards, talk a little bit about the taxonomy, the solutions to some of the challenges, which sound very easy, they're hard to achieve, but I think uh, they're really uh, easy to, uh, to incentivize by finding the right instruments. And in this case, you can use financing, trade finance or supply chain finance to really create incentives, incentives to really make the changes possible. So with that, it's easy to become climate fit. You can use these uh, instruments of the trade and supply chain finance to incentivize this change. And you can, in the perspective, if you can achieve that, thrive really as a business in the future as well. Uh, so with that, I want to conclude and uh, at least thank you for the time. Uh, hopefully you have some questions and uh, we can have some nice introduction uh, 
to a fantastic discussion. Thanks, Bob. Thanks for the presentation, by the way. It was insightful as ever, as it was the last one that you had in 2021. I uh, wanted to ask you, what do you see the role being for DLTs in blockchain and the picture that you just talked about? What role can it play in this, in achieving um, ESG and sustainability development goals? Thank you for the question, Andrea. Uh, to me, I see it as a fantastic uh, infrastructure uh, to provide collaboration between all kinds of parties in the supply chain. The collaboration can be used in order to exchange the information used to exchange data because that is a big huge problem that data can be anything helping your supply chain and with that related it can be any uh, data element reflecting anything related to sustainability in the e the s or the g so that perspective i see it as the infrastructure which is required to exchange the information to collaborate but really in such a way because it creates trust. Uh, what you see otherwise is that you have some kind of central, solu central solution uh, where all the information becomes available. Uh, companies don't want to have that insight, don't want to give that insight, let me put it that way. Uh, and at the same time, you're done bound to this one system. And I think for all supply chains, you require different solutions. So again, DLT can provide this infrastructure to connect all of the solutions required to do your business in a proper way and to make really the whole supply chain transparent and therefore gives efficiency to your operations and to your goals as a whole, as an ecosystem. Yes. Hopefully that answers your questions. Yeah. Is there anybody that wanted to make a question to, to Bob? I mean, that, that was great, by the way, Bob. And I wanted to, to ask you also one more thing. You see, uh, how do you see, I mean, the interaction to this, not only DLTs and blockchain, but other technologies? Do you envisage, I mean... I, I see uh, the, the, the blockchain really as uh, the, this infrastructure which can help you to monitor all kinds of events happening in your supply chain. Um, and with that, it can trigger all kinds of other actions which are required. And sometimes that can be automated because it gets a trigger, for instance, from an IoT device or a location uh, based on the location of your ship, the GPS signal, it can also trigger something. Um, think about, I'm an exporter, I want to deliver goods. And actually, we dis describe based on the income terms, basically, when it arrives at the K of the foreign country, that there, that's the time that means like I fulfilled my requirements, then the location of the ship, together with maybe uh, that your container also receives a signal from a GPS mast again, together with the clearance um, signal from customs, can trigger already a payment. And you don't have to wait for all the paperwork being done by the, the bank of the customer you have in the foreign country. So therefore you can speed up the processes and have been much more um, uh, hold of your own money uh, again and improve your working capital. So it's a trigger of yeah. events and creates transparency because of that and, and automation exactly. of all kinds of other related processes. And enhancing transparency without violating the principle of independence, and let's say abstractness, upon which you see the International Chamber of Commerce, the ICC, the several balls, based all trade fund solution. Think about the LCs, you see, they're all commitments, revocable and independent ones. So undertakings, by the way. So they are not linked to operational side of the contract and stuff like this contract has nothing to deal with. So entering into the new world, into a new space where transparency is definitely enhanced without violating, without breaking totally what's been done over the centuries. So it's kind of a, an evolution, maybe leading to a revolution, but at the stage like, so it's an enhancement rather than real revolution. 
Exactly, and because of what is required for that, the transparency in using this infrastructure, yeah. of course, we need standards. And as I mentioned in the beginning, there are already standards, frameworks, and even many different types of standards. So we have to make it feasible and possible, plausible, that they actually all interact with each other and have the common language. Because we have to be able to speak the same language if we deal with each uh, other. But also, this is really extremely important. And this matches perfectly with what's being done, you see, uh, in digitization, in the standards that has been drawn by the DS, DCSA, by the Singapore Digital Standards Initiatives, you see, we're talking about different standards, technical ones, uh, and other standards for ESG, but you see the purpose is, they're always the same, speaking the same language. Uh, just one other question, Bob. Uh, you know that my background is still deeply into Africa, Middle East, and those developing countries. Yeah. How do you see ESG and SDG into that particular space of emerging economies, uh, LDCs, you see, how they call less developed countries? What are the challenges, in your opinion, and the opportunities for those countries in that space? Uh, it, it is clear that there is a huge challenge there. Uh, it is not that we are in the developed world can say it's your problem because much of the production we actually are not doing ourselves anymore we, because we outsource it over there. So it's not like, okay, now it's there, you solve it. So we really have to collaborate on this. So we would be able to provide them support, not only with knowledge, but also the guys finance to make this transition possible. So also that they make it much more possible to make this transition to a much better and sustainable environment and better world. Actually, the example of living wages is already an example that you actually can improve many things over there without doing a lot of effort. Yes, it may be because that your product becomes a little bit more expensive, but a little bit here makes a huge difference over there. Uh, also help them to think about how can we improve uh, the energy consumption of our processes? How can we make it possible that we are using actually renewable energy much more than uh, coal, gas, or oil, which are easily abundant uh, for those countries normally, and the only source of energy they have. So it requires a lot of collaboration, uh, sharing knowledge, and a lot of funding. Thank you. Does, does that um, answer it? <laughs> does indeed just one last question from my side and then i'll leave it on to the audience uh we often heard, hear about the trade finance gap which is a huge one it's in trillions uh we know how it works you see why there is this gap we've discussed so much in that picture being that why trade funds how can these topics be of any support namely as i often say in redefining the data structure, the data quality, and the data in themselves, you see, in, ref in reframing the way evaluations in trade finance is done. How do you see that, in that perspective? Um, also, by using DLT, uh, it helps actually to get more insight in the data of the company and in the search supply chains and, and to who are they involved with which countries. So for them, it's easy to use this technology, this infrastructure to create data, to actually create a credit rating, which is most of the times lacking for these companies because there's no history on that. So they can build actually this history. Uh, next to that, it becomes much more important to include the ESG factors in the credit rating of a company. So the more you actually show of the transparency and your ESG factors, the better it also is to get this number into these in your credit rating. And if you also know actually who are your buyers, your, your big corporates which are using your products, you can also start using their credit rating and their scoring to actually get better financing because they also can provide you all kinds of means on that. Because you know, if you have a purchase order from this large company, you actually know that this is a large or well, lower risk uh, that you're not getting your money. So therefore, it's much easier to get financing. So it helps to get, create a credit rating. The sustainability factors are affecting more and more in the credit rating, will be part of it. But also 
if you provide this transparency and you show with us your whole supply chain and you're the supplier of food companies, and if they're really large ones, you can benefit from their credit rating as well. Wonderful, Bob. Uh, now, is uh, Kathy has a slider that is ESG scoring and SMEs makes good sense. I mean, thank you for this. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm leaving on to the audience now. It's it's up to me to shut up. I know I talk a lot usually, but I'm Italian. So I'm justified to do so. So I'll leave it on to the attendants to, to, to make some questions, to raise their hands. And I encourage them because this is a great chance to have Bob with us today. And it's a good chance for, for getting some very interesting insights. I also know I presented a lot and maybe it was way too much, way too quick. So yeah, maybe you have to do this on it, but yeah, if there's anything you would like me to repeat or explain a little bit more, please let me know as well. There is a question from Marina Rajevic. She asked, which uh, blockchain framework you recommend for building the collaboration for ESG goals? Uh, am I correct in interpreting BC as blockchain? Yes. I, I, I would uh, interpret it that way as well, uh, Andrea. Yeah. So I, I think this is a very hard question because it really depends which are the players you would like to achieve something. Um, what you would like to achieve, what are your requirements for this? And based on that, you can define what is then the best blockchain framework you can use for this, because it all depends what you would like to achieve. Um, I don't say there is one solution which is better than the other. It really depends on the use case, the participants in the ecosystem you want to create, and how open uh, you would like to share it as well because maybe you want to do it for a close amount of participants or you really want to do everything out in the open and do it extremely transparent. It all depends on really what you would like to achieve and what type of data you want to want to exchange in which way. There's another question from Sara Faraz. She asks, digitalization is key to DLT use case in supply chain and trade funds. But without cross-border digitization, how practical is the use case with blockchain? Your thoughts on the current limited scope, please. Um, it's so true that cross-border digitization is the biggest issue, but you can think of it, there is an uh, amount of uh, single windows for, comp for countries which are out there, which help you to digitize part of your, uh, your trade. And by just connecting these two different digital single windows with the help of this type of technology, yeah, you start to create a common knowledge, certain standard of how to exchange information with two countries or two continents, whatever you want. Also, we have, depending on what you want to exchange at what time, who's in control, uh, there are different ways of doing this. But in, in principle, you would like to have verifiable and comparable information. So we understand what we're really doing and somebody can really check that this statement you make is really the right one. So this is not just limited to a country or a continent. We're talking about global supply chains. So it is required that we do something on cross-border. And even within a continent, there's so much trade going on with different countries. So yeah, cross-border becomes part of it not only for the trade and the information collaboration possibilities, but also for the payments. Hopefully that answers your question, Safras. There's another question from a friend, Daniel. What role will the ISO 20 or 22 immigration play on cross-border digitization? It's a very nice question because I've been involved in the past uh, with the bank payment obligation, which is using basically a lot of messaging within the ISO 2022 standards, yeah. which is actually already a nice standard in its own because it's combining and reusing a lot of understand standards. So, and it's developing in that perspective. So it becomes already 
a, a single useful language to exchange information. So unfortunately, this is still on measures basis, uh, but it provides you a framework at least to talk about the same thing in the same way in a controlled and structured manner. So I think ISO 2002 is one of the possible uh, formats or digitization possibilities you can use for cross-border trade. A list of the companies. Thank yep. you, Bob. Uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry I couldn't be uh, visible virtually. Um, it was very, very good to get that um, high perspective way, way in the sky. And um, so I want to thank you for that. You're welcome. So oh, there's another question from Marina again. And I, I quite like that she's making questions. Do you think that would be possible to create a system tool for self-assessment ready to use for companies and supply chains? I'm convinced that it will be possible. Um, if you think about, for instance, the example I gave you, the e-taxonomy, there are a number of tools available where companies can actually do the assessment themselves. Maybe it's some of the questions are still hard to answer and you require some help. But in principle, it's all meant to make the assessment yourself as a company. So you actually get a good overview of your sustainability overview related to, in this case, the activities you perform on an environmental perspective and how aligned you are with the rules and regulations they actually put forward. And that can be shared with, for instance, a financial institution. So the moment they give, give you finance, they also know how well aligned their finance is if you use it for the activities of your country, of your uh, company. And with that, they have really good, nice, e easy means to report it to the regulator themselves. So yeah, I foresee there will become a number of self-assessments available for your company not only on environmental, but also more and more on the social and the governance perspective. And it will require also much more in the future also to have insight in the whole supply chain. And, and therefore um, it will help you. Unfortunately, currently it's still an assessment which is probably done uh, with a lot of manual effort on an annual basis. But if you use more digitization and technology like DLT or blockchain, you can basically, with the push of a button, get the insight at the moment how well you're doing for your, each of the single trades or for your whole portfolio and your experience over the whole year, month, whatever. Nice question. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Bob. Uh, this is Daniel um, Origlia. In fact, also Italian. Um, uh, I, I heard in your last statement there, uh, you you made a marked a difference between blockchain and I mean, so or DLT. Do we need to make that distinction, or is DLT kind of a sub a subgroup of B, BC? Um, I, I don't want to burn my fingers on this <laughs> on, the, on this discussion. Because it really depends who you're talking to. You have your priests which make a huge distinction if you can use the URT or the abbreviation DLT or blockchain. I, I use it from a business perspective, uh, basically to be single in one, it doesn't matter, or it's uh, uh, a part of which is better or worse. I don't know. I use it basically as intertwined uh, knowledge, uh, uh, terminology from a business perspective. Hopefully that answers your question because uh, I think it's very difficult to, to make this uh, this statement <laughs> to burn my fingers on it. I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, I, I you're very you're very good you're very neutral, which is uh, which is the way you, it, it needs to be. Thank you for answering. You're welcome. Thank you for asking.
Any other questions? Or... You shot the entire attendance club. <laughs> I bored him to death, probably. If you only shot them, <laughs> or, or whether you were fully, uh, let's say, exhausting, you, you gave the full outlook. You say there's no need to make questions, to raise hands. I'm just boring. No. It's not, it's no, not no. an interesting Actually, topic, so nobody has any questions. They just want to fill the time. I think like, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, that's, I encourage everybody to make questions, to pose their own question, if any. Otherwise, we can close the meeting and you see. Hi, this is Daniel Orbiglia. One last question. Um, I didn't recognize in the, the rating um, portion of your presentation uh, one of the groups, the MS, see, you said you didn't remember all of them, but um, uh, I guess this presentation will be made available by by way of uh, maybe the, the Hyperledger. Yeah, okay. yeah and, 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 and to comment on that, it's not an extensive overview. It's the names or the uh, initiatives I'm aware of myself related to standards or frameworks. I don't intend to be complete. And I don't think I have the complete picture myself either. So just as a, uh, a little note on that part. But yeah, it will be uh, shared with uh, uh, the group and available on the Hyperledger uh, wiki page. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's going to be available also on our LinkedIn page shortly. You see just the time to upload recording on YouTube channel. So Bob, if no other questions is in the pipeline, I think we can close the meeting this way. And I wanted to thank you so much for this continuation, actually, of uh, last year, you see, first meeting. It was insightful as ever. So thank you so much for being with us today. And we start from this. You're welcome. It was a Pleasure. Uh, if you might have any questions afterwards, please uh, don't uh, hesitate to reach out to me or any of my co uh, colleagues uh, at the value department. Uh, we can hopefully provide you with the answer ourselves. And if we can't, we can relate you to the person who might be able to do so and use our network for that. So thank you once more and uh, hope to see you soon again. See you soon again. And we're going to be back in two weeks' time. The other time is going to be Thursday, so I hope to see you again. Have a nice continuation of the day, and thank you so much. Thank you, Bob. It was great You're to welcome. have you here today. See you soon. Bye, everybody. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Ciao, Mario. Thank you, Bob. Bye. Bye, Marina. Ciao. There, everyone. Ciao, Marina. Un abrazo.